On behalf of MGM Resorts family, I'd like to first welcome the media, the fighters, and our partners at UFC as we kick off our 2014 calendar here at Mandalay Bay. This is going to be a sensational event and the first UFC event we've hosted at Mandalay Bay in more than a year. Saturday night will once again be a special evening as fans have the opportunity to watch two great female fighters battle in the octagon as champion Ronda Rousey faces off against the challenger Sarah McMahon. The UFC 170 event pro also promises to be a success as MGM Resorts and UFC are announcing today a partnership to bring unparalleled VIP experiences and offers to our M Life members. M Life, for those of you who aren't as familiar in our company's loyalty program, uh, rewards program, sorry. M Life will now provide our customers with knockout access to various UFC parties, meet and greets, discounts on merchandise, and more. Teaming with the UFC now combines the best MMA talent in the world with our iconic venues on the Las Vegas Strip. I'd like to extend a special thanks to Frank and Lorenzo Fertitta, Dana White, and the entire UFC staff. I'd also like to thank the team at the Nevada State Athletic Commission. And once again, I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, look forward to seeing you Saturday night. And now I'd like to introduce Dana White. Good morning, everybody. How are you? What's up? Thanks for coming out. We appreciate it. Who's got the first question? Raise your hand. They'll bring your microphone. Nobody has a question? There we go. Right over here in the middle. Oh, there you go. I didn't see you. I apologize. All right. Uh, question for uh, Daniel Cormier. Uh, DC, obviously uh, a lot on the line here going into the fight with Rashad, potential title implications, et cetera. Uh, you made no secret about the fact that you're a competitor at all costs and you just wanted to fight anybody. Was there anybody from your camp on the management side or any kind of thing like that that tries to get your ear and say, you know, maybe we, we play this safe that you have to argue with a little bit? No, man. You know, um, the, the thing about my team is they know, who, they know who I am. They know that I like to compete and any opportunity I get to compete, I'm going to take it. So, even if they said no, I still was going to do it regardless. It's my career. Uh, I'm in charge of it, and, and uh, they, they work for me, you know. So uh, nobody fights me on those decisions. Uh, we make them together, but ultimately it comes down to my decision. And, Dana, a follow-up to that. You know, from, from your standpoint, you've seen uh, fighters who have a lot to lose that are reluctant to take fights. That can be frustrating for you. We've seen guys like Chael Sonnen who, when they see an opportunity, they step up and want to take a fight on short notice. But it's not very often that we see a fighter in the catbird seat like Daniel who has a lot to lose on the line and still wants that fight at all costs. What does that mean to you that when, when you've got a co-main event in jeopardy that you've got a fighter like Daniel Cormier to do I, that? I think everybody knows how I feel about that. First of all, life is full of opportunity. The fight business is full of opportunity. I, I love people who jump at opportunities. And for a guy like Daniel who's been training, it's, look at him. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw him when he walked in here. He's, he, he looks great, man. It's, it's unbelievable. He's worked hard through this camp to get down to this weight and uh, to have the fight pulled 10 days before is just absolutely disheartening, you know? And he was, uh, he was really upset. And th this thing just, it happened. This thing came together. He wanted the fight. Cummins wanted the fight. We got to fight, man. That's what, this is what we do. This, we, we put on fights and, and we made the fight happen. They're both happy to be fighting each other. And uh, I love guys like that. And finally, a question for Pat Cummins. Pat, uh, UFC fans are hearing your story for the first time. Obviously, there's a lot of intrigue based on what you have to say about your past training with Daniel Cormier. Is this, are these stories things that people close to you, friends, have heard for a long time that we're just now hearing because uh, maybe we haven't been exposed to you on a national stage? Is this something you've talked about for a long time as Daniel has, has rose to prominence? Um, no, you know, I'm, I'm not one to, to go, you know, bragging about myself very often. But, you know, this opportunity came up, and I, I'm willing to talk about it. Patrick, hold the microphone up. We can't hear you. Hey, sorry, man. It's my first time. <laughs> but listen, I'll, I'm going uh, 
I feel like we've gotten really close in, the, in this past week, so I'm not going to call you Daniel. I'm going to call you Dan. You okay with that? And I'm going to beat you up on Saturday. Are you okay with that? <laughs> I'd love for you to come try. <laughs> Man, I hate to break that up. Thanks, guys. Uh, Ron Kruk with Inside MMA. Uh, first question for Dana. Dana, uh, a huge opportunity for Patrick here. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you had to go outside the promotion to sign Patrick to get uh, Daniel a an opponent for this fight? Well, everybody, everybody has fights right now in, in, in that division, and, and he was freaking out. He wanted to fight, and this thing just sort of sort of happened. You know, these things happen organically sometimes. This one did. Um, the kid's undefeated. Um, you know, anybody you talk to in the business. I even had big wrestling guys, you know, text me saying, you know, this, this kid's legit. He's good. He was obviously good enough to help him get ready for the Olympics. Uh, you know, he's got great credentials. Daniel wanted the fight. He wanted the fight. So here we are. Very good. Did you offer anyone else in the UFC light heavyweight division the fight? No, there was no, there was nobody else nobody. open. Yeah, there was nobody else. Open. And, 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 you know, you'd have to be nuts to fight Daniel Cormier in 10 days notice. Very true. Daniel, question for you, uh, besides your love for Popeye's chicken, uh, how difficult has it been to make this cut? Or what has been the most difficult part of this weight cut? You know what, man? It hasn't been that bad. I've, uh, I've just kind of had to do things a little different. You know, throughout, this, throughout my life, I grew up in Louisiana. There's red beans and rice and Popeyes on every corner. I didn't have salad in my entire life until this training camp. I'm 34 years old, and I'd never touched a salad in my entire life. I had a few salads, and, and uh, I started losing weight. Plus, it's healthy food now, and I got somebody to help me uh, make my food and and just help me at all turns, man. You, you use your resources to make this as easy as possible. So it hasn't been that bad. But, um, you know, I was home for Thanksgiving, and, and, and my girlfriend actually made a big, huge salad. And all this food was on the table, fatty food. And at the end of the day, that salad had not been touched. That's the house I grew up in. Nice. Final question for you. Uh, you're in crunch time, 24 hours away. What are you weighing right now? How many more pounds do you have to shed? And how are you feeling? Um, I feel great. You know, I, I was able to train last night. I was grappling. Uh, this morning, I, I was uh, 209 pounds. So I'm only three pounds away from weight. And I'm going to make this thing easy because I want to compete at my best. I train hard, like Dana said. I beg for this fight. And, um, you know, this guy's not he's, not, he's never at a loss for words. But I'm sitting there going, Dana, but I trained so hard. And all he kept saying was, I know. But I lost all this weight. I know. And, if you, you know, this guy's never lost for words. So he knew what it meant for me to get an opportunity to compete. So I'm making this weight easy so that I can compete well on Saturday night. Heidi Fang, MMA Fight Corner. First question for you, Dana. Uh, what is on the line here with the welterweight picture with Rory McDonald and Damian Maya's fight? Yeah, it's a big fight. Obviously, uh, you know, Rory was right there before his Robbie Lawler fight. Lawler's getting a shot at the title now. It's a big fight for these guys. It's, you know, every fight is a, you're in a must-win situation, but... For these guys right now and where they sit in, in that division, it's a very important fight for them. And for you, Rory, being that this is the first time that George St. Pierre is actually not fighting anymore in the UFC, do you feel like you finally have emerged out of that shadow? And what do you feel that you have to prove? I never really felt like there was a shadow there. Um, it, it, it is less pressure not having to respond to the question, am I going to fight him? When are you going to fight him? This and that. And so that whole thing is gone. So th that that's a relief, but I'm I'm just doing my own thing, you know, uh, one fight at a time on my own on my own journey to the title. Uh, there was never a shadow cast upon me with George. And for you, Damian, uh, being that you are also coming off of a loss, what did you learn from that loss to Jake Shields, and what do you feel that you have to prove in the welterweight division? I learned a lot of things, you know, but f I think the main one was like. I got a user to fight here in Vegas, in US, and for the first time in that fight I fought in my city. And I think it, like unconscious, I, I, I relax more than normally. And I like to fight here in Vegas because, you know, I, I feel this is the city of the fight and I feel like uh, the energy is different, you know. So I always won when I fought here and I hope to keep winning tomorrow, uh, Saturday. One last question for Daniel. 
Uh, not having Kane in this camp to train alongside of you, being that he's injured, how different was your camp in preparation? It was tougher, you know, because you can't really replace him. I mean, he's the best in the world, and he works harder than anybody uh, that, that's my size. But you know what, man? I, I used my other partners. I used Luke Rockhold, who's also very good. Uh, a lot of guys just in the gym, and I just mixed them up. Every day I sparred three different guys. I didn't spar one person. Uh, but you know what, man? Kane was around. You know, he was there to do my cardio with me, there to do my speed and agility drills with me, and, and just there to hang out, you know? So uh, just having him in the gym was, uh, was a good, was a good, it was an added element to, to, to him not, you know, being there at all. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was okay, but um, I was prepared. Uh, every training partner that I had could beat Patrick Cummins, so I think I should be okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, question for, for Rory, first of all. Um, Gareth A. Davis, Daily Telegraph, BT Sport. Um, Rory, um, in your last fight against Robbie Lawler, you, you seem to be almost stuck between two stools, kind of almost corralled into a game plan. Are, are you going to kind of let yourself off the leash in this fight and become the freestyle fighter that we've seen you in many of your other contests? Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've definitely uh, trained that way. You know, I, I feel like more of myself is coming out in the gym, and I expect that to come out in this fight. But did you feel that you were trapped in a, in a game plan in the last fight? Uh, I wouldn't say game plan. It was just, it wasn't my day. My head was not there. Uh, couldn't pull the trigger, and couldn't just, I couldn't just be myself. I was, it was just off. It was not a good day. Uh, and a question from, from Miss Rousey. Um, Rhonda, um, it's, I think Sunday, it's uh, a year to the day since you uh, defended the women's bantamweight title for the first time. Can you describe, in some ways, this extraordinary year in which perhaps you've become, people are talking about you as the biggest star now in, in the UFC organization, and how far women's MMA has come in the last year on this platform? Um, I would describe it as juggling on a unicycle. That's my, my favorite analogy. Um, but it's, it's been really fun, you know, it's, it's definitely a whirlwind and it's challenging at times and uh, I think that women's MMA has made so much more progress than I even could have hoped for that even within that one year we've already added a second division and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the 115 pound girls go and I'm so looking forward to having another women's champion in the UFC. And are you going to win by armbar on Saturday night? I'm going to win by the most entertaining way possible. And finally, a question for Demian. Demian, um, the big talk is how you're going to close the distance with Rory and how you're going to deal with him in the stand-up. Obviously, we know you're, you're a wizard at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. How are you going to close that distance with him on Saturday night? That's, that's a secret, but... Uh, you know, I think I learned a lot of things about close distances when I fought Anderson and I was not able to close that distance. So, you know... I learned a couple of things there, and I think now I know more how to do that, you know, how to close that distance. Uh, Connor Cordova, MMAWeekly.com. Uh, my question is for Sarah. Sarah, when it comes down to your style of wrestling, do you feel that that will be enough to really stifle the judo of Ronda or... Did you have to bring in somebody special to work on that sort of, sort of judo style that's very unique to Miss Rousey in the UFC? Uh, for every training camp, I try to see if I can, you know, mimic the people that I'm fighting the best that I possibly can. So, you know, I had some of the people that I'm familiar with and some different people to, you know, get as close as a grasp as I can on my opponent. But, you know, you never really know until you get out there and you feel it yourself. Is that it? Back here? Hello. Uh, my question is for Rhonda. Rhonda, how hard was your training for this fight? Um, well, I, I almost feel like I had two training camps in a row for this fight. And uh, I think this definitely was the best camp that I've ever had. The last fight, I, I started in shape. I wasn't really in fighting shape. I went 10 weeks without really being in my gym or sparring or anything. 
and uh, the beginning camp was spent getting in shape, and I had some obstacles with, you know, injuries and being sick, and um, by the end of it, I was in the best shape of my life. We did pull it together, but it was a struggle in the beginning, whereas this camp, I started in the best shape of my life, and um, uh, the best performances I've ever had, just historically, have always been when I had the fastest turnaround, and I never got out of shape. I started in shape, and I didn't have to spend time regaining lost ground. I spent all my time improving, and I really feel like I'm going to have the best performance of my entire career. And it always has a lot to do with my competition. I, I fight better when I have higher level competition. I mean, it's the same way with my sparring and everything. And um, you know, I, I think that also comes with being an Olympic athlete. You're, you're raised to rise to the occasion and fight above yourself when it counts. And I know that Sarah is exactly the competition that I've been waiting for to show that what I'm really capable of. Fans, want to ask any questions? Nobody wants to ask any questions today? Thought this was a press conference. This guy in the, the white shirt, yeah. Don't ask tickets. No, ask a question. I, I don't want tickets, but, but I do want to know if I could join you on stage tomorrow for the weigh-ins. I knew, I knew it was going to be something. Is that cool? Do you have any questions for the fighters up here? <laughs> Sarah, you think your wrestling is good enough to beat her on judo? Yes. There you go. And yes, you can come up on stage with me tomorrow. All right. Any questions from the media? Yes, Dana. Yeah. Uh, I have a follow-up question here. I was wondering if you could update us on the exact injury of Rashad Evans. Of what? Uh, Rashad Evans' knee injury. Uh, yeah, he's got to have surgery. Right. Do you know exactly what's wrong with his knee? Like I don't. Like whether it's an ACL, MCL? Okay. I don't Thank know. You. Go ahead. Right here. You got it. Go, Connor. You can go first. Uh, Daniel... When it comes down to it, we all know this fight has gotten incredibly personal for you. At what point do you have to really put your emotions aside to be in the best mental headspace possible, or do you, can, do you feel that you're really going to fight better because this has gotten personal? Um, you know, uh, the thing is, I can, I can, Pat and I can fight all week and argue all week, but when we step into the cage, I have to be a professional. Um, that's something I've never uh, strayed away from in my whole entire career. I'm going to fight the way I fight, regardless of... Uh, if, uh, if I'm mad at Patrick or if I'm happy with Patrick, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to fight the same way. You ever wonder why street fights last 10, 15 seconds? Guys are fighting with pure emotion. They can't go any longer. You get tired. So I'm going to be a professional, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the cage and do what I've done every single time I've ever fought in my entire career, uh, and that's uh, get my hand raised. Go ahead. Um, this is for both Sarah and Rhonda. Since we're sort of in the throes of Olympic fever, even though you guys didn't compete in the Winter Olympics, I'm wondering if you've been watching the Olympics, and if so, does that bring back any sort of memories? Is that motivational for you to remember what you accomplished or the fact that you didn't accomplish what you set out to do? And does that play into today in, in, in any way, shape, or form? Uh, I don't really feel like that. Um, I, the winter sports has always been so separate from what I do that I really can just watch it and you know, just be in awe of the, you know, like the figure skating and the different competitions because it's so different from what I've done that really I just like look at the skills and appreciate it. Uh, actually, I wish I could have watched a lot of this Olympics, but I've been so focused on camp. I haven't really uh, watched anything at all. And uh, it, it, it seems that I always have a fight exactly the time of the Olympics. I wanted to go to the London one to, to watch, and I had a fight, like, right on the day of closing ceremonies, you know? And it's just, uh, it seems to be playing out that way. And uh, I, I do miss that feeling of, I'll, I've never really had that feeling of being a spectator, I mean, since I was a little kid. And so the next Olympics, I'm, I'm hoping that I can take full advantage and actually be there myself and get the real experience, you know? Uh, this question is for Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda, a lot of times when we see a grappler versus grappler, I'm over here, hi. It's very nice to meet you. Um, when you see grappler versus grappler in mixed martial arts, we'll see what ends up being a stand-up fight. Sarah's been so dominant in grappling her previous opponents. How do you prepare for the unknown of Sarah McMahon's stand-up? Uh, well, I'm prepared in every single area, and uh, she has certain tendencies that we're aware of and that I'm ready to take advantage of, and then I also spend a lot of time just covering my own holes and, you know, improving myself. I mean, uh, everybody kind of forgets that I won the world title a year after my pro debut, 
You know, I've, I've, been, I've been learning on the go. I jumped into the deep end, whereas Sarah's casually waded over to the deep end. And, um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm constantly trying to improve myself all the time while I'm here. And uh, I try to prepare for every opponent individually, but a lot of the time I just spend on trying to improve myself. And I have one for Daniel Cormier. Daniel, did you find the transition from Rashad Evans to Patrick Cummins much easier based on what Patrick had to say? Because obviously you were facing one of the greatest fighters of all time, Rashad Evans. Now you're facing an up-and-comer with an undefeated record. How do you stay up for that fight, or has it just been based on what Patrick said? Well, I mean, you know, again, uh, Patrick's a high-level competitor. Uh, the guy is actually, to do what he did in wrestling, college, I mean, to make a national team, to become a two-time All-American after walking on and not placing at the high school state championships, that's a big deal. That doesn't happen very often. So I know the guy can compete. I know he's dangerous. Uh, I've seen him for a long time. So it didn't take very much for me to stay up for the fight. But with that being said, my preparation was so thorough for Rashad Evans that I should be able to fight almost anybody else because Rashad has been one of the best fighters in the world for a long time. He's been the standard for a wrestler boxer in UFC for a long time. And, and uh, if Pat's a guy that wrestles in boxes, I prepared for the guy that has done that better than anyone else for a long time. So I'm up for the fight because I respect the guy. Um, he annoys me, but I respect him. And uh, I can't wait to compete against, or fight against him. Rhonda, I'm kind of hidden by the podium, but you have so much going on in your life right now between uh, the UFC and signing movie deals in Hollywood. Can you talk about how you're balancing both careers, and is there a worry that you might lose your edge in the octagon because your schedule is so busy? Uh, no, I think my busy schedule helps me keep my edge. Otherwise, I would just be, like, chilling and vacationing somewhere, you know? It keeps me sharp, and... Uh, the way that we deal with it is the second I got back from shooting those other movies, I wasn't allowed to talk about it in the gym at all. Like, it wasn't allowed to be mentioned or even at a home. So I, I just had to really pretend that it, it didn't even happen. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much what we've been doing, doing for, for this camp. You know, all this stuff came up, and um, my representation was very considerate with taking care of everything for me. And I only had to have one meeting, and that was all. That was it. So um, I only spent you know, 45 minutes of my time in the last six weeks dealing with Hollywood stuff and every other minute has been entirely focused on this fight. It doesn't exist to me at all until this fight's over and I've won. Dana. Dana over here. Uh, yep. Right here. Your uh, left. Your right, I mean. Your right. Right here in the front row. <laughs> hey. S sorry. What part of that story with Pat is so interesting to you? The, uh, I mean, you made the call, the... Uh, I made him cry or the, the, the coffee shop. Just that whole story seems so interesting from really a nobody to a UFC multi-fight contract. What, yeah, no, to the you, whole, what makes it interesting? The whole story is fascinating. I woke up, I was driving to the office in the morning, and, uh, you know, I started hearing about this. They were going at it on Twitter. And uh, I, I, I heard about Cummins and, and, you know, who he is, what he had done, and what he had said about... Uh, about Cormier so I got his uh, I got his manager on the phone and he literally said uh, you know I said does this kid want this fight he literally had to drive to the coffee shop he was working at to uh, to see if he wanted the fight his manager would not let him talk on the phone because uh, he was working and he went around to the drive through handed him the phone and while I was talking to him about the fight he got fired they fired him and uh, he said I hope I get this fight because they're firing me for talking on the phone. So it's a very unique, interesting story, and, and uh, I think the whole thing is cool. Went from, you know, went from a guy, and, and that's, that's no different than any, um, I don't care what you, if, if you're in Hollywood trying to be an actor, you're waiting tables in the daytime. You know, a lot of people have to do things to, to put food on the table to, to you know, uh, to reach your goals, and, it, you know, he, he was doing it, and, and it all just sort of worked out. So huge for him. I mean, the kid, like you said, I mean, he paid him the, the biggest compliment, which is true. This kid walked on and became, uh, you know, an NCAA um, All-American two-time, went, went and fought for the world championships, uh, wrestled, I mean, and, you know, the kid steps up and takes a fight with Cormier on 10 days' notice. Uh, pretty cool. You know, this, is, this, this is the real Rocky story right here, this kid. I love it. Building off that story, a question for Patrick Cummins. And Patrick, I mean, hearing Dana 
retell that story. You know, emotionally, describe your feelings. I mean, is this a surreal experience for you right now? Yeah, this is definitely a surreal experience, but it's something that I've, you know, I've been working towards for, for, for four years now. And, you know, the, the, I think what some people overlook is, yeah, this guy was just working in a coffee shop and they pulled him off the street and now he's fighting. You know, I, I got my, my, my job at 3.30 in the morning to 9.30 in the morning so I could make it to train at 10 o'clock and then I could take a nap, do whatever I had to do and train again at night. All, all for this, all for you know this dream of, of making it here and and coming and competing with the best guys and, and beating them. So, so um, you know, I, it's just it's great that the first part of my dream is realized, and now now I'm ready to go realize the second. Do you have a message for uh, your old boss at the coffee shop? <laughs> no, you know, the, the, there's no hard feelings there. Um, you know, I understand I understand what they're doing, but. Um, like I said, I, I was I was at the end of my rope. Um, didn't you know? I, I didn't. I couldn't pay the bills, and and this is the only job that that fit my schedule, where I needed to do. So they helped me out. You know, I, I for about a month they they gave me a job, and I'm grateful for that. It, otherwise, you know, I, I wouldn't be here. I'd probably be I'd be on the street somewhere. <laughs> so a serious question, just to follow that up. You're four and zero. You've been at this for four years. Why have you not been more active? Um, you know that that's a story in itself. We've been we've been searching for fights for a long, long time, and it just it seems like nobody wanted to step up. We've had about 40, 50 fights um, fall through on us, and um, you know what? Too what, to, to add to that, when I called when I called uh, Cormier's team, you know, Bob Cook said to me, you know, nobody wants to fight that guy in the in the smaller shows. Nobody wants to fight him. Um, so I found that interesting that, you know, Cormier's team was saying that. Patrick, this question's for you, and it's a follow-up a little bit right here. Where are we coming from? Oh. Follow-up a little bit on what Ron asked, but uh, Daniel's been pretty heavy on the you're not going to be ready for this rhetoric. You know what I mean? It's all going to be too much. Well, yesterday was media day. Today's the press conference. How do you feel? I don't know. You guys tell me. How am I doing? <laughs> I feel like I'm doing okay. Right? I, I mean, this is this is no different than, you know, getting up and, and competing, you know, at, at the level that I've competed in, in wrestling. And, you know, I, I competed in Strike Force, a big show in Strike Force. And, you know, I feel like I've been there and I'm, I'm ready to step right in. Dana, over yep. here. Yep. To your left. Hey. Um, so Cormier was minus 1300. I think he's moved to minus. 18, 1900. You betting? Uh, Cummins is uh, 920. Well, I know Fox Sports, UFC is big on the betting odds. Would you say this is, if Cummins were to beat Cormier, um, how would that rank in terms of the biggest upsets, combat sports history? You know, Mike Tyson, Buster Buck Douglas was a 42 to 1 underdog. Yeah, that, so, one, that one's still probably the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. But where would you put it? But this? in MMA, it'd still be hard to beat Sarah and George St. Pierre. Would you say Sarah would still be a bigger upset? Probably. You know, St. Pierre was, huh? 8 to 1. Yeah, still big upset. You know, came off uh, came off that season of the uh, the com the comeback or whatever the hell we called that season, the Ultimate Fighter, and uh, and knocked out George St. Pierre in the first round. Still, I think that was still the biggest upset I've ever seen in, in MMA. Question for Dana uh, over here, Dana in the front. Um, to what extent um, have you found as a promoter for this event that having your headliners both being Olympic medalists um, has enabled you to reach out further into the mainstream in terms of the coverage of the event and the kind of conveyor belt of publicity, if you like? I don't know. You know, I, I think, the I mean, we've all seen she gets, she gets publicity that nobody gets. She gets uh, um, TV shows and, and, and write-ups that none of the other fighters get. Um, I, so I, I think that there's a lot of unique things, obviously, you know. I mean, if you look at this fight, again, this is the second time since, uh, since the women have been here that, that, that women are headlining an event. Um, you know, I think her gate in, 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 um, in uh, Southern Cal that time was, was a $1.3 million gate. She's going to do a $2.1, uh, $2 million gate this time. Um, if you look at, and I know, the guy who said he'd never do women in the UFC, uh, look at it. Look at, look at where it is. Look how big it is. And, and 
every time, uh, every time we, 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 uh, we have women on the card, they, they usually win fight of the night or they're one of the most exciting fights of the night. And, and I'm blown away by how big it is and, and how much bigger it's going to get. But, but what, what I'm asking is, do, do you Are think... we getting any other stories because of the Olympics? I have no clue. Mm -hmm. It would make sense, but I don't know if... I don't know. I don't go on the internet, so I didn't read anything. Anybody else? We done? Thank you guys very much for coming out today. We appreciate it. Thank you to the fans. Um, we're going to get this stuff out of here, and I'll square these guys off for photo ops.